He came to take the gun away, and it was on uh, he and his sergeant detective. They were staking out the wrong house. It was across the street, and I'm playing around with the car, standing next to the gun in the trunk. They come over and ask me about, uh, excuse me, sir, uh, do you know who lives in this house across the street here? Well, that house was 609 Harriet. He crossed back over to this side into 609 Ord, and they were looking for me and didn't even know that, see what I mean? Bad news. Well, at any rate, we walk into the house to have them ask my mother about this other house, and I'm saying, hey, which 609 are you looking for? And they said, are you Ed Kemper? Yes. And it goes on. And uh, I needed to find out what they were looking for, the murder weapon, the 22 automatic, or the 44 Magnum. And I don't want to advertise that I've got a whole bunch of guns. Uh, so I made a comment to, to divine between the two. And uh, I said, yes, quite a little gun, isn't it? And he retorted, well, 44 Magnum, I hope so. And I said, okay, because that loaded 22 was under the front seat and guaranteed me an arrest right on the spot. And uh, 44 was in the trunk. I had forgot that. I took him in the house, we went into my bedroom, and the closet doors open, and I have a high-powered rifle with a scope on it. You had some other stuff in the house, too, yes? Yeah. I had the personal effects and identification of the last two co-eds that had been murdered about two months before, right next to the guns in the closet, in a box. Could he have seen it? No, but when he arrested me for having all those guns and went through the rest of the closet looking to see if there were any pistols or anything else, he wouldn't have, couldn't have helped notice a purse, a book bag, and co-ed ID inside of those belonging to their two latest murder victims. I'd back up and said, oh, excuse me. I just remembered so, and instantly he responds to what I'm saying, my hand moves, back we go outside, and he's still thinking, boy, this is a really nice and helpful guy here. Uh, some of these people uh, do what you and I do to become better killers. They practice their trade. Did Kemper stop himself uh, toward the end of his career? Kemper says he did. He says he could have gone on. He said he had fantasies of killing uh, uh, dozens more people, of leaving a trail of bodies across the country, and at one point he just got on the telephone and turned himself in. He said it was time for the killing to stop. In his case, he said uh, publicly that it was his mother that he was killing all along. And when he killed his mother, uh, that was the end. It's a very deep psychological observation from himself. It uh, may be very accurate. It was springtime. It was April. Uh, and for two months, I hadn't killed. And I said, it's not going to happen to any more girls. It's got to stay between me and my mother. And it's got to, I can't get away from her. We're still fighting. She's still belittling me. She's still, I'm like a puppet on a string, and I entertain her. She knows all my buttons, and I dance like a puppet with that pain. And it had even gotten physical to where I had physically grabbed her and thrown her onto her bed, trying to emphasize a point that she's I was threatening to kill her. So here I pick up these two young ladies in Berkeley on Ashby Avenue. One has flowers in her hand, petite little dolls. They're in granny dresses, and they're hitchhiking, a couple of real experts. I want to see how together I am, if I can resist this temptation. You going to Walnut Creek? Great. And they get in my car. They want to go one way. I know they need to go the other. If they go the way they're insisting on, we're headed right back out to where the first two co-eds were murdered. And I'm saying to myself, oh my God, all I got to do is relax and they'll take me to their death. I've got the gun in the car, the same one I've been doing it with. I insisted as gently as I could, I took them where they needed to go, to their college. Hey, thanks. Hey, thanks a lot. That was one week before I murdered my mother. I said, she's got to die and I've got to die or girls like that are gonna die. And that's when I decided I'm going to murder my mother. I knew a week before she died, I was gonna kill her. And she went out to a party, she got soused, she came home, went to sleep. I was woken up by that, I got, came out. I walked up to her bed. She's laying there reading a paperback. As many thousands of nights before. And she said, Oh, I suppose you're going to want to sit up all night and talk now. Shit. I looked at her. I said, no. 
I said, good night. And I knew I was going to kill her, you know? And I'm so cold, it's so hard. And that's the first time in 10 years I've looked at it that way. I mean, that intensely, that honestly. It hurts. Because I'm not a lizard, I'm not from under a rock. I came out of her vagina, see? I came out of my mother. And in a rage, I went right back in. For seven years, she said, I haven't had sex with a man because of you, my murderous son. It's one of our arguments. I cut off her head, and, I'm, and I humiliated her corpse. It's there, you know? A six young woman dead because of the way she raises her son and the way her son is raised, the way he grows up. And what's her closing words? I suppose you want to sit up all night and talk. God, I, don't, I wish I had. Hmm? Your grandmother and her daughter-in-law, your mother, were two women very important in your life, and you killed them both. Could you say what they were like that led them to the same fate? Same thing that kept them from ever being friends. They were both aggressive, um, matriarchal women. They'd been the daughters of strong matriarchal women. I still loved my mother, and it's hard for somebody to comprehend that you murder your mother through love. It isn't a rational process. It's a very painful process. It isn't rational. And I've got to still live with that. Why did you wind up giving yourself up? It had to stop. It had to stop. Uh, once my mother was dead, there's almost a cathartic process at that point. I got physically ill right then, when she died, when I murdered her. And once she was dead, there was no way I could back out. I had backed down from giving up a thousand times. You know, I used to get drunk and go sit out in front of the sheriff's department in a parking lot across the street on one of those little concrete parking berms. And i just sit there and say, no, I still can't. The clanging doors, I could still hear them. No, because it'll never open again. You know, so I, I, I uh, rationalized that to give up would be insane. To give up would be crazy. I'd be giving away my freedom, and I don't need to. But I look back on that and wish I had earlier, when I was saying those things to myself. The people who were later dead wouldn't be. The regret that came later would have not had to be. Those people, not things, those people would still be with their families, with their loved ones. They would have their own families. If I had had the courage to make that decision, instead of painting myself into the corner. Where might you be if you'd never given in to the impulse to murder? Where might I be? If my parole had been successful. Uh, I believe I'd be married, I'd have children, I'd be heading toward my first grandchildren.